great. So hello again, thanks everyone. And uh, welcome to the research readout. It feels like a bit of a nerd conversation for all of us um, to really dig into um, all those interesting research as um, aspects that all of you have been doing. But again, grateful for having you online. Um, we'll hear today from Mark, from Stefan and from us, uh, specifically RT and Lucy um, on social sourcing research team from YSB. Um, and the impulse here was really coming from the COVID Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs um, and obviously Caroline here presenting the secretariat of that um, to look at um, what is already out there when it comes to connecting social entrepreneurs to companies um, and uh, go beyond that a little bit also um, what can actually be the effects of that. And uh, the, the major idea here is that we get a better understanding of the existing expertise, the existing programs, the existing best practices. So we can jointly build programs, concepts, um, insights that are relevant to the sector and are plugging a real gap and a real hole that is not currently addressed. So um, with that, we've reached out to a couple of you and see what kind of content should we share. Um, in the next session, uh, we're hoping to feature uh, Social Entrepreneurship UK the various by social campaigns, um, as well as the Social Entrepreneurship World Forum. Um, we had a few chats with the World Fair Trade Organization the last uh, days as well. And I'm sure uh, hearing from them will also be quite interesting. Um, but the ultimate goal is to build something on top of that um, that is addressing some of the gaps and some of the things that we need to address in order to scale the impact of individual social entrepreneurs. So with that, I'll actually shut up right away um, and we'll hand over to the first presenter. Um, and um, the first one on the list would be Mark. Mark, welcome. And uh, Mark, um, as, um, as I mentioned, uh, working with Moving Worlds, um, I've gotten to know Mark from the SGRID program that you're doing with, uh, amongst others, specifically SAP. Um, and lots of relevant work in connecting social entrepreneurs to companies and creating revenues for them. So keen on hearing more about what you've been working on. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, audio is coming across okay. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, screen is showing up okay. Very much so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's uh, let's go ahead and skip the about moving worlds, um, and I'll just jump into here. Uh, into the into the research that that we did, and I'll start this because I think um, I'm also going to start my timer right here. Um, I'll I'll start this with with I think some data that a lot of us are are seeing and reacting to and familiar with, right? And this from the the PwC SDG challenge that you know 72 percent of companies are reporting on the SDGs, and yet right we're also seeing that you know, here according to PwC, that we need also a step change in scale of depth and in business engagement. And as Daniel had shared, you know, we support social enterprises around the world to build their capacity so that they can partner and connect into the global economy. We also operate an institute where we can support professionals across any sector to figure out how to best build partnerships with the social enterprises. And so we're very excited when we see research like this. Uh, and, you know, for, for years, we've been referencing this report from Deloitte that talks about five different research back ways that companies benefit from engaging in social impact. And I think probably to those of you on this call, none of these are, are that new. I think I've been lecturing on this at the University of Washington for over five years now. And yet there is this challenge, right, that even though companies that do this, right, and they do report on these, they tend to outperform their peers by about 10%. Uh, you know, a Financial Times article from, from 2018 that shows that companies that do this outperform even more recently, investing in firms with better records on social issues pays off. And yet there still seems this ongoing struggle of executives actually believe in the case for more investment into social impact into building partnerships with the social enterprise sphere, and yet they don't, and, and why? And, and we really set out to better understand operationally, what are companies doing to move forward in the process, right? To say, hey, we know this is good for us. 
how can we actually build out more of these connections? So that really laid out the backdrop for, for us in our research. And if you haven't seen this article, I think it's an interesting one. The too long didn't read here is that most executives are free market capitalists. They believe that if the business case is so strong, somebody whose core competency exists is actually going to be the one that, that jumps into it. But I think for us, we were really curious to see how is this going to, going to work for social enterprises. So we conducted interviews um, with now over 75 different organizations, um, uh, corporate social responsibility leaders, government leaders, board members, social enterprise leaders, a couple of people on this call. Uh, and, um, and then we read a lot uh, of the things that we actually read that we actually think are worth sharing are, are embedded in the report, which of course we'll share out the link for. So this turned into a long report really with the question of how can capitalism help lead to more sustainable and equi equitable recovery by incorporating and integrating and pulling in the social enterprise sector. So. Uh, you know, I think in going through it, uh, I'll share some of the highlights, but also share some of the, the emotional highs and lows that, that we encountered with it. Uh, this was one that literally just had our team laughing, right? In interviews, you ask people, what is a social enterprise? And you get like 10 different definitions of it. Um, you know, I still wonder who has who has the best definition. Uh, I'm, I'm I, of course, Stefan, the good to know. <laughs> um, you know, I'm biased. I think we have a fun 600 year history article uh, that that was created by our our institute, um, and and we kind of try and try and educate on this process in there. But you know, there were also some moments that were that were quite frankly a little bit de-energizing. Um, and and maybe one thing I I should just add here is the way that we looked at it, like very simply, was is there something in your articles of incorporation? Do you measure and report on it? And are you actually looking at how do you align all of your resources towards doing some good? but you also are improving your own policies so that you're monitoring and aware of all the harm that you might be creating and, and, and working against it. Um, so some de-energizing moments, uh, no surprise that this was more likely to come from like board members or executives. Uh, so this from, from, a, um, from a, a, a venture capital list and board member of multiple companies, including a publicly traded company that everybody's heard of. There's a growing movement around the purpose of companies that is certainly noteworthy, and many of the biggest corporate executives are thinking at this, but companies are legal entities that were incorporated for a reason, and leaders need to be careful about what they stand up for. Employee populations are increasingly diverse racially, geographically, and politically, and corporations cannot be the moral conscious of employees. It's an important question, but it needs to be considered carefully and with the consideration of long-term implications. I can, of course, understand this quote, but I will say people that tended to have similar lines of thinking here, also tended to, um, I think, cross and still kind of bucket social enterprise as philanthropy, just the newer, better, cooler word for philanthropy. Uh, so uh, uh, a few kind of key points that I thought were really interesting that relates to this, less than 10% of publicly traded boards have KPIs or committees related to ESG. So even if the company itself is reporting on it, uh, in fact, 96% of the biggest 250 companies do report on ESG, if they're actually setting targets is a separate question. And I think it's also noteworthy that less than 1% of, of publicly traded companies, this is US specific, these data points. Um, I know the EU is much more progressive here, uh, but they actually have a C-level sustainability leader. Uh, of course, there were some uplifting moments as well. So uh, a quote like this uh, from a, a CSR leader at, at an international tech company. So companies are making bigger commitments on sustainability, equity, justice, and other social factors. Most don't know how to achieve this in order to achieve them. They will need to partner with the new type of enterprise, the social enterprise, which prioritizes and measures sustainability, equity, and justice factors alongside profit. When these businesses with a social focus are integrated into supply and distribution chains, only then can corporations reach their increasingly audacious sustainability and equity commitments. And, you know, I think this morning I was just reading that, you know, Netflix has now said they're going to be net zero, right? We're seeing this almost like on a weekly basis, new companies are releasing this. And I think they're becoming aware that in order to get there, they need to partner with on their, their sector. Um, th there were some wow moments as well. I think this will probably be the least surprising to people on this, on this call, right? The rapid growth in ESG investing, 
um, the growth in ESG reporting and something that Moving Worlds is going to be spending a lot more time kind of looking at as well is that corporate impact investing seems to also be growing very quickly, right? 50, 54% um, a year if you compound that annually since, since 2016. And I'll use an example here that kind of came up, right? In the US, Amazon invested in Rivian. It's an electric uh, tech company, uh, car company, um, not through impact investing. That was like through their core VC, right? And then you know, years later, then they also submitted an order for the first 100,000 trucks, right? I think we're seeing a movement here where companies are figuring out how to do off-balance sheet investments in order to, to also help pave the way for ESG targets down the road. And I think that builds a, a, a lot of potential for, um, for, for social enterprises. So, you know, here's some of our, our key findings. On the company's side, um, you know, this is this is our, our our tweet length summary. We think companies are missing the biggest business opportunity of our time to move into a, a circular and regenerative economy. Right. This is actually a direct quote from Paul Pullman, former C CEO of Unilever. We also think they're exposing themselves to a lot of risk. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever be saying this, but it's interesting to see Apple take a increasingly um, progressive view on. Um, uh, executive compensation, sustainability, and other factors, but it's also smart, right? Mining minerals is complicated, and the more um, controls there are in place, the harder it is for new entrants. Um, CSR leaders, we're seeing some people really just like stand and lead and shine in, in impressive ways. They're saying, you know, this is the time to really integrate social responsibility as part of the crisis. Um, However, because of, of typically executives who are still like, well, how many hours did we volunteer and how much did we give to philanthropy or did we get that good press release? There also, there's a lot of risk of distraction. They're focusing on too many initiatives uh, at, um, at, the, at the same time. Uh, social enterprises, if you found a social entrepreneur, you found somebody who's asking you for money, um, they seem to be very focused on this, right? The minority of social enterprises will go through impact or will grow through investing. Um, and we think that they are missing opportunities to, to scale on revenue and or through corporate partnerships. Uh, accelerators, and I'm generalizing here, uh, similarly, the minority of social enterprises are going to make it to that next funding round. And we think the majority of social enterprises still actually have the ability to plug into uh, a lot of these trends in, in, um, uh, in corporate spending. Uh, and government, we barely, barely touched on, but we do think there's a lot more that the governments can do. So, you know, I think the common theme here is that the social enterprise sector and partnerships will grow rapidly um, because of operational expenditure, capital expenditures from corporations, um, not only from social procurement, but also through corporate impact investing and also through more partnerships. Uh, and we think that there is um, a, a way that kind of all main players could, could be a little bit more strategic here. And, and I think I'm saying this um, uh, maybe a little provocatively and also not giving proper credit to, I think, especially a lot of the people on this call, Agora, Acumen, Eunice, that I think are being very strategic here. So this is, this is less about the people on this call and more about the people not here. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, I think that puts me at, uh, at 10 minutes. Uh, uh, David Lair was uh, the, the lead on this research for Moving World side. Uh, and so if you want to get in touch with either of us to talk more about this, we'd, we'd be happy to chat. Uh, and I can, I'll share out these slides and also link to the report. Uh, Daniel, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Mark. That's uh, super helpful. And I think uh, frames the opportunity quite well um, in uh, why this all matters. Um, and uh, I actually just read a, an article in the FT just a few days ago, actually, that um, there was an investor group that was exposing um, that. Um, not even a handful of KPIs along the range of their core pledges. Um, so I think uh, there's a big opportunity for social entrepreneurs to engage. Um, Mark, one thing that would be super interesting to this group is, and because you're also working with social entrepreneurs hands-on uh, through Askrid and other programs, um, what are some of the concrete challenges? And maybe there is a top three that you have in mind for social entrepreneurs to leverage that opportunity and actually actively work with companies. Yeah, so um, you know, uh, 
in September, we had someone from Pepsi sustainability team speak to our community. And I, and I think he framed it really well, right? Which said, if you're going to come sell to me in the sustainability side, I don't have any money. I will do whatever I can to get you in here, um, but don't, don't sell me on social impact, right? Um, instead, go find the person within the organization and I'll help you if I can and sell to them from the business standpoint and realize that increasingly our business leaders are under increasing short-term pressure, but now also long-term pressure. Uh, I think to quote this, I still need a certain number of potatoes every month in order to hit my quota, right? For my, you know, my, the, the country that I'm in charge of. In three years, it has to be sustainable. Right here, right now, next month, I have to reduce my margins, right? So how can you be a partner to me on both of these? So, so I think that's one. I think the second thing is social enterprise. We get this all the time. Introduce me to, to your partners, get Microsoft, Gucci, PayPal, right? Get, get me in and no way are they at the level of capacity or support in order to do that. So we spend a lot of our time saying, let's map the value chain, right? Who is a supplier to Gucci, right? Like let's, let's go down and let's figure out how can you partner up with a local manufacturer or artisan community or, or others. Um, and then the third is at some point you have to make some long-term investments, right? You have to get some, some legal policies in place and understanding around master services agreements and statements of work and pricing strategies so that you can be prepared for those negotiations. Um, and those are longer term investments, right? Sales cycles are long. So kind of building up that, you know, kind of burn the midnight oil on that so that you can continue to, to get ready for this opportunity, right? Even though it's a longer sales process. All right. Thanks a lot. And then the, your first comment, actually, um, I had to smile at that. It's uh, it's like um, getting the best of everything. Um, at least that's what uh, what it, uh, what I'm hearing, right? So short-term sourcing criteria at cost, you know, no additional cost, but at the same time, long-term sustainability, maybe fair trade, and all the certifications you can think of. Um, so, how much of in that respect, how much of an issue is that really for the social entrepreneur, or how much is that an unrealistic expectation of the corporations that they have to change in the future? Mm -hmm. I, the, the social enterprises that we're seeing that navigate it this well or, or navigate it the best are, are being very strategic in their approaches, right? They're saying, hey, you want the best for me, right? You want lower cost and with these social impact. But look, we, we know from other markets that there are ways to make that model work, right? There is a role for philanthropy, right? There is a role for investments to help do that. So they're actually approaching these like very complex sales processes, if you will, saying, can we actually de-risk your, let's say, supply chain investment by also incorporating maybe leadership development, maybe your marketing team, right? Maybe your sustainability team. So can we work across more stakeholders in the enterprise so that you company can still get what you want, but you can maybe help feed in some of the capital that's needed so that we can get to that level. Um, so it's kind of a, a, not a direct answer, but that's that's where my mind goes on that question yeah so it's the hybrid hybrid value um approach right it's creating value yep. beyond just the cost or the let's say the cost targets yeah it brings and uh, using other sorry and, and using other enterprise resources like for marketing that otherwise maybe wouldn't be involved in the supply chain to help achieve those yep. interesting yeah for everyone if you have other questions as well um, you know feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll have a bit of time at the end to address them or then uh, shoot them to mark but your last comment also actually links back to Stefan um, when it comes to you know engaging as many stakeholders in the organization as possible and you know creating value across the organization because uh, I personally think that's also then the most efficient way to cause transformation within the organization through that partnership, right? Um, but uh, Stefan has actually much uh, looked into this much more than uh, I would have, so <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you, Stefan, and uh, give us a bit of an overview of what your research has uh, unveiled in the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I'll also share my screen to get the presentation up. Voila, are you here? So we've done, um, so my name is Stefan Panaus. I'm from Social Enterprise Netherlands. We're the national membership body here in the Netherlands for, for social enterprises of uh, over 400 uh, members throughout the, the country. Um, yeah, and last year in, in, in 2020, we've done a research on what we call the influencing role of social enterprises on 
or mainstream businesses. And um, so why have we done this, this research? Uh, obviously from a, from a societal point of view, uh, Mark also stated, you know, big business is, uh, is acting more responsible, but it, yeah, it, it should do it faster. And maybe social enterprises can play a role here. And actually this is also something they, they want. So in our yearly survey, social enterprise monitor, uh, yeah, actually almost all um, social enterprises stated that they don't only want to create impact by employing disadvantaged groups or uh, whatever they're doing, reducing food waste, or but also by uh, being an, yeah by influencing other uh, organizations by being an example to those uh, organizations. So try to create impacts uh, wider than your own uh, organization. But this is not a topic at least we know uh, we knew uh, a lot about. So we thought that's yeah that's interesting to to jump into. Um, and really look at, uh, let's say, the Schumpeter style innovation that social enterprises uh, uh, might create. Um, so we've started a, um, a research in, uh, in in 2020. It was it was a scoping study done uh, done with funding from uh, from Porticus. Um, so it's 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 also not a it's also not a very big research, but um, so we've done research with both uh, uh, or uh, sorry uh, interviews with both social entrepreneurs and uh, people from the corporate side. Um, quite extensive literature re review. Uh, worked with some academics who are already very active in uh, in the field of uh, um, markets uh, market creation, sustainable market creation, uh, and held several. Um, expert discussions. Um, so I'm not going into this, this very, uh, not uh, is a, a, a bit of complicated uh, a graph. It's also more um, used to say, so um, that we really looked into academic uh, literature. All right, what do we know about, about um, yeah, market creations, innovations, sustainable innovations. And we've used a lot on the, um, uh, of the transition th theory um, that actually states so there are how how niche innovations so really small innovations can actually become more uh, more mainstream so that's a bit on the theoretical framework uh, we used we mostly looked at, at social enterprises from the Netherlands although most of them are working uh, internationally uh, hopefully you you know a few of them I think uh, Fairphone and, and, and Tony Chocoloni are the most internationally known social enterprises here in the Netherlands, um, but for example, Spatially Sterre is a Dutch social enterprise that um, uh, employs people with autism and works in, uh, in IT. I think a model we also see in, uh, in several countries. So also uh, so interviewed them and um, on, on how they wanna, uh, well, uh, influence other businesses. Um, and actually, we came up with um, well after the interviews, after the literature review, actually with three main uh, categories where uh, or know how social enterprises can influence other businesses. So the first one is on um, we call it raising the possible. So this is all about um, yeah creating knowledge and uh, innovation, both technical and, and and social innovation or business model innovation to show that it's actually possible in this way to act more, more sustainable. So for example, um, if we look at, uh, um, at a company like Tony Chocoloni, it might charge, charge a higher price for a chocolate bar. And previously people would have thought, well, consumers are never gonna pay for this. Well, uh, and they demonstrated that uh, consumers are. Um, so this is really showing that it's, uh, that it's possible um, and in this way, uh, influencing other businesses. Um, second part is on raising the desirable. And this is really about changing, yeah, norms and values. What do we think, uh, um, yeah, in society, what do we expect from companies? What's, um, uh, what's expected, yeah, um, from them. This, this relates also to, for example, consumer pressure. So can, social enterprises put also a subject on the agenda. So for example, in sustainable fashion, we've seen this where there's, and there's maybe a small group of, uh, of sustainable fashion brands, but, but that really put, put the problems in the fashion industry on the agenda, show that it's, uh, uh, yeah, that you're able to do things differently. Uh, and in this way, uh, yeah, raise the debate and 
change consumer behavior. Um, and this uh, larger businesses have to respond to. Third part is uh, raising the acceptable and this, this relates all to changing laws, regulations, but also standards. So certifications um, uh, like the fair trade uh, standards, uh, but also really we've, um, uh, we've seen companies, uh, for example, like Tony Chocoloni here, who are really lobbying to change to change laws in the Netherlands on, uh, on international uh, uh, sourcing. Um, and we've put, yeah, we've uh, identified 11 activities um, that we see that, that social enterprises do, um, yeah, into these three categories. Um, and maybe two examples I'm, um, I'm thinking of is, so for example, Fairphone, which is the, the ethical smartphone company, um, yeah, they, they started the, the Fair Cobalt Alliance. So uh, got it, gathered a group of different businesses. Also, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of larger business also from the, the, the cars industry um, because now with all the electric cars, uh, they all need cobalt. Um, yeah, and they've, they've formed an alliance to say, all right, how can we source our cobalt uh, in a more sustainable and ethical, uh, responsible way? Um, um, but for example, also Tony Chocoloni started the, the Open Chain Initiative where they actually say, all right, this is the way we source our cacao in a way we think this, uh, this provides farmers with a living wage. Uh, this is how we do it and you can do it uh, yourself as well. Um, and for now, the, the largest supermarket chain in Netherlands has stepped into that, followed their, followed their example. So yeah, they've... That, that relates more to number three. So showing that it's, uh, uh, that it's possible um, yeah, and getting other, other parties on board. Um, um, well, this is the, this is the overview. Um, um, I think, no, let me leave it for uh, regarding time to here. I can answer questions um, later. Um, so what are conclusions now we're going further with this? So, um, I think both theory and practice shows that uh, yeah, that social enterprises are capable of uh, extending their influence to to other uh, other businesses. Um, but we do think, well, you know, more research is needed to to find out to what extent this is possible, how effective it uh, it actually is, what are possible negative uh, consequences, right? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. We've seen a, a large group of social entrepreneurs want this, but there's a small group that do this really strategically and, um, and, and also have the, the skills and resources to do, this, uh, to do this properly. So this is also where we wanna, where we wanna uh, develop, let's say tools or courses that can help social enterprises uh, become more effective in, um, in influencing other businesses. Um, yeah, we also think more more awareness of the potential role of uh, uh, of social enterprises in influencing other businesses is is needed. So this goes, I think, um, if we related to the topic of social procurement, this goes procurement. I think is one or our partnerships are uh, are are a very important way uh, how social enterprises can uh, can influence their uh, other business. But I think it's important to state it also happens indirectly, right? And it can sometimes also be um, how do you say it can be uh, strategically wise not to uh, to form a partnership, for example, to get yeah get your hands more free and um, uh, so this could be something interesting to to discuss maybe um, and also maybe we really wanna um, it's not stated here but obviously our research is now mainly based on. Um, or at least the cases part is based on cases from the Netherlands. So we definitely want to take this, uh, this international. Uh, well, the link, obviously you can, cannot click on it, but I'll put it in the, uh, put it in the chat and I uh, can always reach out to, to me, uh, put my email in the chat as well. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, this is an overview of what we've, uh, uh, what we've done and uh, happy to answer some more, some more questions. Thanks, Stefan. And uh, for anybody who wants to, wants to jump in, feel free to simply ask the question either on chat or here. Maybe I'll start the, the canon yep. with uh, one question. 
how much of a proactive approach do you see on the side of the corporations to actually trigger their transformation or their progress towards ESGs um, and uh, then selecting social entrepreneurs as the vehicle to do that? So how much of the companies actually proactively do that versus other companies or, or companies that just see that after the fact, oh, wow, this actually had a transformative effect. So how much is ex post and how much is ex ante? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good one. I think what we've seen, um, we, we haven't seen uh, uh, that much uh, larger businesses that really do this proactively. I think mm. the, the ones that do it are, are in the school, right? So uh, obviously, uh, IKEA is a, is a very interesting uh, example. Uh, yeah, SAP as well. Um, if we look, but if we look, for example, uh, so in the Netherlands, we also run a bi-social program. Um, and I do see the examples of where a large bank, um, uh, ABN Embro, they worked with a, um, with a social enterprise, a small social enterprise called Sign Language uh, Coffee Bar, where you can, uh, uh, where um, uh, um, deaf people, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, work and you can order your uh, coffee using uh, sign language. Um, and it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively small social enterprise. It's a relatively small contract economically, but it really puts the the topic of inclusion uh, on the agenda of a large, large institution in the, in the Netherlands. So, so I do see the wider effect. Um, I'm not seeing that many uh, larger businesses that really say, "Hey, this is the key key way to do this." I, I think there's a, a world to win there. And what, are the, what do you think are the levers to do that? I think um, from Mark, we also already heard that obviously making the argument for buying from social entrepreneurs in the first place is a tricky one that needs many stakeholders that are involved. Um, if you now add a layer of transformation on top, I have a feeling yeah, that could become even more critical or as I say, even more complicated. Yeah. How, how do we get, and, and this is a key question that this group is also asking itself, how do we burst the bubble? How do we get out of the, the handful of companies that are much aware to, to use that? Um, how do we get out, outside of this bubble? Yeah, I think it, uh, it's a bit of a boring answer, but I think there's still potential in just um, uh, where the cases we, we have. Um, yeah, make them more more visible and more aware of um, um, within where larger businesses will just make it more uh, uh, yeah just tell tell more the story that all right if you want to change it should uh, uh, doesn't need to be very complicated you can start with a uh, uh, with collaborating with a with a social enterprise this is this what other business learn from it I think in a way, a collaboration with a social enterprise can become a bit of a safe space, right? In, a, in a, um, experimenting with well, different kind of sustainable innovations. Um, mm -hmm. I think where there's also, yeah, there was a quote from, uh, uh, from Paul Pullman. He, has, uh, he had an um, interesting book. Uh, there was a written an interesting book on him. I think it's in Dutch. I don't know if it's translated, but he also stated like, and it's more on mergers and acquisitions, but the um the b corps they acquired they you know that really uh accelerated uh, let's say the sustainability transitions within uh, unilever so mm -hmm. i think we just need need more people saying that more loudly maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> or get um, more social entrepreneurs into those collaborations um, yeah no definitely uh definitely. increase the yeah. pressure yeah. great i see a few people coming on camera if you want uh, if you have a question just uh, feel free to shout out to stefan Otherwise, yeah, I can put it in the chat as well if you want to. Um, and then I'll actually, thanks a lot, Stefan, for providing those insights. And um, on the topic of getting more social entrepreneurs into those partnerships, um, I'll hand over to RT and Lucy from our team to give a bit of a sneak preview of the research we've been doing. Um, I've, I've had to wrestle them a little bit into having this conversation because um, they're very much uh, focusing on getting good results out of the research and we're very early um, in the journey. Um, the research is actually only gonna come out in the middle of this year. So you're getting a bit of an exclusive insight on what we've learned so far. Um, but thanks a lot, Arti and Lucy for agreeing to do this. Over to you, um, the, the general goal of the research is really understanding drivers and challenges for social entrepreneurs to collaborate with companies and close those commercial contracts to increase their revenues and therefore their impact. Over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, so let me then just quickly 
share my screen. And that's working. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say um, that uh, super, super interesting um, insights from, uh, from Mark and uh, uh, Stefan just now. And it's really, really cool to be part of this growing family, as Dan calls it, of people that are working towards the same goal. I think it bodes really well for, you know, all of the work that all of us are trying to do. And finally, final disclaimer is that I'm going to play my Indian card here and say that uh, we're going to go a little bit over. Um, we're not going to be as perfect in sticking to our 10 minutes. So I hope that's OK with everybody. Um, OK, so let's just jump into it. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is frame the research for you a little bit and then hand over to Lucy, who will talk you through some of the insights um, that we found in the research. So to begin with, um, as you might know, um, last year in the first edition of our research, um, uh, Business as Unusual, which we did together with our partners, Porticus, um, uh, the Schwab Foundation and INSEAD, uh, we focused on understanding the barriers and enablers to corporate purpose from the lens of the social entrepreneur. This year, we're building on that research that you might be familiar with again to understand the barriers to corporate transformation, but now from a few different lenses. Um, and these are three different lenses. The first is from the perspective of the C-level and shareholders, which is um, going to result in a CEO purpose playbook. The second, which is relevant to this conversation is to understand the challenges and transformation effect of integrating social businesses into corporate supply chains which will result in a practical hands-on guide on how to create these partnerships. And finally, um, our third piece of work is going to be to uh, quantify the business case for purpose um, through experimental surveys that we're running as A-B tests on key uh, corporate stakeholders, which will hopefully result in about 5,000 new data points that will help us, all of us, prove that good purpose is actually good business. And we're halfway through this research. And as Dan said, we're looking at launching it through August and September. Um, so today, obviously, we're going to be focusing on the, sec on, uh, on the social sourcing piece of our research and um, sharing just some very initial insights from that work stream. So to begin with, um, let me just tell you about what are the key questions that we're looking at answering through this research. Um, so while the core output is still this very practical handbook on corporate social business readiness, we're not merely interested in those partnerships as an end uh, in themselves, but like Stefan, we want to understand their impact on broader corporate purpose transformation. Um, and so that's the first sort of uh, set of questions that we're trying to answer. What are those levers through which social business integration leads to corporate purpose transformation? Second and third come the key questions, the, uh, the meat really of our research. And that is, what does it take for a social business to get corporate ready? And on the flip side, what does it take for uh, a corporate to become social business ready? And then finally, um, the last question that we're looking at answering is also around scaling of impact, because um, do these partnerships, we want to understand whether these partnerships actually result in scaling impact or whether there's some element of mission drift. Um, and that brings us then to some definitions and just the contours of our research design. So let's start with definitions. Um, for the purpose of this research, we're looking at partnerships along the corporate supply chain defined as those processes along the supply chain that start at sourcing and end at recycling um, that are both material to the company and also where a partnership has the potential to solve an environmental or a social problem. Later, we also expanded the scope. Initially, we were only focusing on core procurement, but later we expanded our scope to consider all addressable spend, including non-core procurement, because of insights that we found during some of the interviews around the quantum of non-core spend available, um, its suitability for early stages of partnerships, and um, its impact on corporate culture um, as a lever for purpose transformation. And I'll talk about the next two points on uh, just show you a little bit about 
who we're interviewing. So we're interviewing a total of about 35 organizations split across corporates, uh, social businesses and intermediaries. Um, and also where uh, we have a pretty good geographic spread as well, because while socioeconomic, regulatory and cultural contexts impact the theory of uh, our theory of corporate transformation, we thought that those differences might be interesting to capture. So while about 60% of our interviewees bring in a North American or European perspective, we also have representation from other parts of the globe. Um, and finally, um, to frame the insights themselves, at this early stage of our research cycle, we have not yet quantified our data, and we also don't have permission to share names of people that we've interviewed. Um, and we, we were not allowed also, therefore, then to share quotes. Um, so we thought what, what we do is um, uh, share the learnings in the form of various elements of the corporate social business integration journey. Um, and um, I'll hand over in a second to Lucy, who will take us through this journey in fairly chronological order, um, starting with uh, basically taking us through the challenges and some best practice solutions that we've heard, starting from pipeline issues, pre-procurement, um, going on to then evaluation and the challenges around the procurement process, then to challenges around capacity building, financing, and then finally scale. Uh, so with that, Lucy, over to you. Thanks, Arti. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk to all of you today, as I really hope that our research will bring concrete insight and best practices for practitioners to foster social sourcing. Um, let's jump in. So as a first topic, if you want to create a social sourcing partnership, obviously you need the partners to find each other, right? Um, on top of an overall lack of visibility for companies to find the right social business uh, for those partnerships, we also hear from social entrepreneurs that they often struggle to understand what types of products or services that the company wants to buy and how they buy it. To take a concrete example here, we interviewed the social enterprises in the food sector that found it very difficult to build the right offer if they wanted to sell to companies. They first worked on coconut sugar, but there wasn't really a market for it. It's a really niche market. And now they started working on rice, but with a too advanced milling process that doesn't fit with corporate supply chains. Having an initial transparency from companies on what they buy and how they buy it, we believe it facilitates the partnership. It also builds trust. And in the long term, it can foster the demand by inspiring new social enterprises to engage into the B2B market. Um, I, if you can, yeah, awesome. Um, in terms of evaluation and procurement, so now let's say that the conversation started between the two partners, the company and the social enterprise. And the new challenge for the social enterprise is to pass the initial evaluation of the procurement team and to comply with all the standards of the industry. I can highlight one best practice uh, for the evaluation topic uh, on top of price, volume, quality, and deadline, uh, ability to meet the deadline. Those are the four main topics that the procurement team is looking at. Companies can include a proper impact metric into their decision and give it a more or less important weight if it's a truck or the plastic for their packaging or the sugar in their CEO bars. Um, having this rationalized metric help to create the proper evaluation to integrate and give a chance to social enterprises. On standards, because we are mainly looking at multinationals here, they have very demanding and detailed requirements for the suppliers, which is really not surprising. They check administrative and legal compliance. They follow international labor conventions. And for the food sector, obviously, you have to follow international as well as national food safety standards that are really demanding. Many companies also have very specific ESG criteria, and it's getting even more common now, which is often very hard for social enterprises to comply with. And we can think that it's ironic, but this is really the case. Um, looking at companies with successful partnerships and who overcome these challenges, uh, we have seen two best practices. Some decide to put aside those requirements and create a tailor-made standard that is relevant for social enterprises. Others choose to keep it, uh, keep their standard um, and 
put it as the end goal, but acknowledge where the social enterprise is at, is at, sorry, and co-build the runway on how to achieve it. If I take an example of a very large company that has extensive experience, including social enterprises in their supply chain, when what they do is to start with an initial assessment of their standard. And when we interviewed one social entrepreneur, he was saying that he actually ended up with 50 out of a minimum, minimum score of 100. So what they did is to work together extensively for three months with daily calls in order to reach this minimum of 100 and when it was reached they built a plan to improve the score as the partnership grows and tick all the boxes on the checklist that goes up to having the right material in the factory for the floor of the, of the factory so it can be really detailed and it's really this runway and ramp up of all those criteria either way if it's on this side on uh, on the for those two best practices, one thing that looks obvious from our interviews so far is that companies have to show some flexibility on their supplier requirements if you want to have a successful partnership. If you can, yeah, awesome. Um, which brings us to the human capacity topic uh, because this partnership requires so various expertise uh, that social enterprises usually don't have in house at the beginning. So we talk about compliance and standard, but there is also all the quality control, the export, the custom, overall supply chain, uh, pricing strategy that Mark was mentioning. All of this is usually not already in the social enterprise uh, and it needs to be built. So as a, as a best practice, first, social enterprises need to invest and to hire the right people, especially for the middle management and preferably right at the beginning. For instance, the CEO of a social enterprise told us that hiring someone fully dedicated on supply chain and exporting goods who, who had the right acumen and background on that was one of the best decisions he has made in the past years. Hiring people from the industry that you are targeting and that you want to sell to uh, seems to be a good practice in general. Then many companies get also involved and do a lot of capacity building themselves through expert field visits, regular follow-up, a lot of co-planning and co-design of products together with the company and the social enterprises. And this is quite unusual for a buyer and supplier relationship, but many companies state that is very just essential. Um, here, we also see what is not really a best practice right now, but an opportunity for a shared service platform for social entrepreneurs for some specific expertise that they need, such as compliance, legal advice, export procedure, or even pricing strategy. Those expertise can be uh, shared through, um, across social entrepreneurs. Um, now let's talk about finance. First, social enterprises need to be sure that they bite what they can chew because those partnerships require heavy investment in terms of OPEX and CAPEX just to become corporate ready and able to deliver the first order. Some already have the financial strength from an existing B2C activity that was running over or through the ability to subsidize the launch with donation if they have an NGO and having this dual structure of a company and NGO. But even beyond this upfront investment, um, to become corporate ready as volume increase, cash flow management becomes very often the main challenge for social enterprises to pay their operation and supplier to deliver the order. Very few companies uh, on the side of the company, very few of them are flexible on payment terms, even though the ability to do advanced payment, and we had one company that does up to 30% upon request, is a huge enabling factor. Purpose driven financial intermediaries that can bridge this gap, for instance, with specific loans uh, for each other, um, as a key role to play here. And unfortunately, we don't, we haven't seen so many of them. Um, so that could be a gap as well. Finally, in the long term, finally for the, for the finance uh, topic, in the long term, social enterprises need to be careful of their dependence toward those very large contracts. Some buying companies actually set up this risk mitigation as a goal in the partnership. For instance, one company requires that they shouldn't represent more than 30% of their revenue streams of the, for the social enterprise and ensure over the time that the social enterprise diversifies their revenues. 
which means that the social enterprise should be able to go to their the client's competitors, for instance, or many of them also have a B2C activity locally or through e-commerce that usually brings higher margin, even if it's lower volumes, but that helps to balance the, their portfolio. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick here because I'm seeing that uh, time is running. On scaling, many partnerships that we have seen started small uh, through a pilot on a bespoke product or a seasonal collection, launching through very few points of sale only, or even starting with the non-core procurement, which is sometimes more flexible and suitable, as Artie was saying. Um, as the partnership grows, one great feedback that we have here, uh, that we heard from social entrepreneurs, um, is that scaling doesn't put their social mission at risk. Actually, on top of growing the impact thanks to these volumes, we heard great stories of operational efficiencies going hand in hand with social impact. To give you an example, a social enterprise that was giving income opportunities to OME-based uh, OME uh, women artisans had to open a factory at one point. And what could have seen as a compromise on the impact actually led to stronger empowerment as the workers were more satisfied to come to this factory and be part of this community than staying at home. Looking ahead at what is needed uh, to scale social sourcing, and we want to see it as in depth as well as in breadth, meaning by amplifying the scale of existing contracts and initiating new partnership in new companies and industry, the role of intermediaries is essential on various topics to foster demand at the company level as well as uh, among consumers to improve this pre-procurement visibility that we mentioned at the beginning, and finally to support social enterprises on capacity building and access to finance. This is something that we often hear from our interviews. So I guess Unusual Partner is on the right track and I'm going to end this presentation on this feedback. Um, we don't have a slide for this, but obviously feel free to reach out to me, Arti, as well as Dan, if you have any question on the research even beyond this presentation. Thanks. Great. Thank you both. Um, I'll open up for questions um, if uh, there are any. But otherwise, as Lucy said, happy to also answer after the call. Maybe as one input um, for the follow up steps here um, is the quantification of some of these uh, insights and in order to understand what is the prevalence of some of these issues uh, among social entrepreneurs and companies, but also what's the severity of these issues and, and a bit of a ranking um, as we're following up on that. Um, uh, just a brief question. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in all this research, I mean, fantastic presentations. So how much, how much could you find common factors among big corporates and the relationship with social entrepreneurs and how much is context specific? As spe or specific to certain corporates, for example. Anyone? Yeah. Sorry, do you want to go ahead, Artie, or should I? Uh, go ahead, Lucy. Yeah, um, it's a very interesting topic because um, even though we want to uh, interview and see companies in different industries and on different type of supply chain um, Sourcing, meaning that we interview people on the social sourcing as well as recycling, as well as core, non-core. Um, so sometimes we feel that we are comparing apples and peers a little bit. And the common factor, um, no, I, I, I don't think, I think, so what Dan was saying is that we're gonna add kind of a quantitative um, aspect on the research and trying to rank those challenges and seeing more uh, comparable points, uh, data points. So I believe that at this stage, I wouldn't say that we have seen any common factor because on the drivers, as well as on the industry, we've seen successful partnership happening with very diff different contexts. And, and I'll just add though to, to Lucy and maybe try and jump into the future and predict it a little bit, but I suspect since that, you know, we're looking at creating intermediary support here, is that the areas where intermediaries can play a role that seem to be fairly common across everything that we're hearing is perhaps some sort of shared services platform um, for compliance, um, for, for social enterprises to be able to access capacity to do that compliance and comply with, the, you know, with standards at an affordable price point, 
or alternatively, um, some sort of solution around the financing, which again seems to be a problem that we're hearing uh, across the board. But apart from that, as Lucy said, especially since she's been really deep into the research, um, again, each of these problems uh, manifest themselves uh, very differently in different contexts and therefore have very different solutions. Stefan, Mark, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, no, I'm thinking, uh, well, not out loud, but I was thinking hard to, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one, right? But if, because if you look <clears throat> into it too much, too detailed to a certain case, or it, it's always very uh, uh, like context specific. But I, I would say, um, yeah, maybe five minutes, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, what I want to say. I think the innovation element, right? So um, uh, a social enterprise brings in new stuff that uh, that for a corporation is more difficult to to try themselves. So they can, for some reason, put a bit of the risk uh, involved with innovation. Uh, let's say outsource it. I think that could be a, a, a common factor. Um, and if you, if you make it more practical to, to social source, sourcing, what we see from our by social network, we, um, you know, there are common factors like, all right, is the social enterprise able to offer the quality? Uh, is there a price uh, element, et cetera? So it, but that, those are almost normal uh, procurement questions, but we do see that all the, the larger corporations that want to engage more with social enterprises do, do need to answer those questions, so to say. But, I'm not sure if that was your question, uh, Jens. Uh, but this is definitely a topic for uh, for a mm -hmm. webinar of its own, uh, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And Mark, before we uh, answer Dave's question and then uh, close. Yeah, I, I um, you know, in, in some capacity, right, I, I think businesses are, are remarkably similar, right? And the, um, Within every business that that we spoke to, there were examples of people that were passionate about social enterprise or or blocking efforts. And I think for us, the most consistent thing was was there some type of executive and board level support for for the initiative, right? Either by setting a, a target or not. And I think in that capacity, there is a lot of similarity um, uh, uh, across the the enterprises, um, but it's. Yeah, I, th I think it's, and, and so that to me was kind of the piece that I'm the most hungry to keep going for is how do you, how do you influence and help get, you know, we've helped a couple companies get targets at that level and it's, it's very hard. And they're, not, my opinion, they're not always the right target. So, you know, how do you, how do you do that work? And, and I think that's, that's incredibly challenging. Right? I think some companies like an IKEA have, have managed to, to actually do that and set a model for, <laughs> but not all the way, right? And and so I think how do you how do you set that model? And I think that's a really really important conversation now. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, I mean, for many of us, it feels a bit frustrating at some points, right? Uh, we have a few really um, trailblazers uh, um, companies that are leading the charge here, and it feels like well, how could we just scale this up to so many more organizations around the world? And, um, and increasingly, we're seeing well, there is. Uh, not a magic wand, um, but as we as we go along, I hope that there is uh, at least a growing lever for that kind of change. But Dave was also asking whether there are specific uh, industries or service areas uh, for social entrepreneurs to actually have success with uh, corporates. Um, anyone that wants to take that. We do, we do see, a li um, th this is not based on research, but just looking through my eyes, we do see a lot here in the Netherlands happening in, uh, let's say, the food and beverage world, right? Where there are larger catering companies, like, uh, I don't know what they're called. Uh, the, but, and, you know, they want to, um, uh, we see a lot of innovation, let's say, in, uh, in uh, social enterprises working in food, either on food waste or like meat replacement, things like that. So that's definitely an industry. I see uh, see a lot of uh, exciting things happening, um, but uh, uh, yeah, there are much more fashion maybe. I would say. You know, if if I can add one thing, and of course I did the research with Mark, so I'm not kind of an outside, <laughs> just an outside observer. But 
We saw opportunities within the distribution space. And I know this group is focused more on supply chain, but particularly if you were to look at health, which is a super highly regulated industry for a social enterprise to provide something into the health supply chain, really challenging to meet the standards, but for a social enterprise to sell health-related products, I, I think there are opportunities and maybe that's a good uh, topic for a, a future discussion. And, and Dave, on, on that point, uh, it, it's super interesting that you're saying health and Lucy and I exchanging emails because uh, we were talking about exactly this yesterday. Uh, but uh, financial services, fintech in particular, might, you know, might show exactly the same characteristics. And energy, especially when it comes to product distribution. Yeah, abs absolutely. Well, great. Thanks. Well, I think we have uh, food for thought for uh, upcoming webinars, at least five topics to talk about. Um, but for now, I just want to refer you to April 19th, which is going to be the next session with the next set of uh, interesting uh, research projects. Um, thanks for uh, joining today and thanks for making the time uh, specifically to Stefan, Mark and uh, Artie and Lucy uh, for presenting today. Um, all the best for the initiatives going forward and um, looking forward to the next conversation here as well. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Have Bye. a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.